Welcome to the daily Glasgow Cappuccino. Start each day of COP26 by drinking in a few minutes of warm, stimulating conversation about climate resilience. I'm your host, Peter Willis from The Resilience Shift. Shall we begin? My guest on this morning's Cappuccino is Sheila Patel. Sheila is an Indian activist and academic involved with people living in slums and shanty towns. Back in 1984, she founded Spark, which she still directs. That's the Society for the Promotion of Area Resource Centers. Sheila is globally recognized for getting urgent attention to the issues of urban poverty, housing, and infrastructure onto the radar of governments, international agencies, and foundations. Welcome, Sheila. It's lovely to have you here with me. I'd like to start by asking you, as we uh, walk into COP, what's the one thing that you most want to land with the resilience thinking community at this moment? My work for the last 30, 40 years has been working with people living in the generationally in informal settlements. And that the work that I do as Shack Dwellers International and as Spark in India, both worldwide and local, is actually watching this, this part of the city actually grow exponentially, despite all the rhetoric of the Millennium Development Goals and the SDGs and now the climate justice element of climate change. What is very clear is that all cities in the global south are locked in the pursuit of modernity. And when I say modernity, what I mean is that as part of our colonial heritage, we all want to become like the northern cities, which became modern in the 18th and 19th century, big roads, fabulous transport, beautiful houses, 24 seven piped water. And what that pursuit of modernity did was to accept a form of economic growth that only ended up for whatever reason to address the needs of the already existing formal city that was produced by our colonists. And as a result of that, you have people living in the city and people living in the shadow of the city who are invisible, who are marginalized and whose numbers are exponentially growing for a range of reasons. You can say all the reasons you want, but the reality is that our colonial history and even the history prior to that was one in which lots of people didn't have access to land, amenities, services, identity that got formalized to be like that in our colonial periods. In Southern Africa, it was apartheid that did it. In all our environment, we didn't have apartheid, but we had a form of apartheid, which was there before even apartheid came to Southern Africa, which is caste. You have a huge number of people living in very small part of the city. In Mumbai, for instance, about 50 to 60 percent of the city, which is informal, lives in 8 to 13 percent of the land. As a result of it, the modernity imagery produces bigger roads, more cars, uh, huge high-rise buildings, swimming pools on the 40th floor. While the people who live in the shadow of the city don't have adequate water, sanitation, health, and uh, work also informally. So what climate change has done, if we believe that is what the global agreement is, it wants to pursue a sustainable development process that is inclusive. That's what it says. And if it says that, then the modernity model and the sustainability model don't align. 
for me, that is a issue that has to be central in this discussion. You take any aspect, you take food, you take health, you take water. We don't have the governance structure, the fiscal structure, or the political commitment to address any of this. So for me, that's what's completely missing. And that is what I would like to put at, in the middle of the table. Not to say the other points and the other concerns are not important, but they depend on this is what I'm saying. I'd like to ask you then, as we move into the turbulence of climate change, what could happen that could be transformative in this area that you're, you've just described so beautifully? I believe that the real transformation for climate change is local adaptation. It's to do with the choices that individuals, collectives, neighborhoods, cities, nations make. And those choices today are based on consumption, more consumption, more of this, more of that. Even the poorest slum dwellers aspiration is more consumption. And a lot of that consumption pattern is destructive. I mean, you take any field and you will find this. You know, by always thinking of it, you know, we are the planet. Yeah, we are the planet. But the choice that everybody makes produces patterns. And today, we have culturally moved away from traditional choices to modern choices. And that's why my overarching concern is about modernity and sustainability. For me, those issues are not being discussed in the politics of climate change, which in the COP discussion seems to be very different from what people outside the COP negotiations talk about. So Sheila, can you give me, um, in simple terms, the, the, the characteristics of resilience that you think most are going to matter or are going to matter most what qualities and capabilities are, are they going to find most valuable? And should we and anybody be investing in helping them to develop? Resilience requires everybody to form a chain. So if you don't form that circle and you follow this top down saying that the lion has to, you know, through the food chain, kill the insect and the slum dwellers are the insects. That's not going to change into a sustainable process. Even the urban poor themselves have to change. But for their change to happen, there has to be a systemic change everywhere. Otherwise, their survival strategy is like walking up the down staircase. You know, you're running, but you're in the same place. That's what's happening to poor intergenerationally. So, we all have the courage to talk to people who are otherwise like our enemies. Can I talk to a food corporation who is destroying my food habits and say, you change and I will change. I will change and you will change. Can I tell my mayor or my minister to say, take care of everybody because it's only when everybody is alive that we are alive. It's what the pandemic has shown us no, today. Nobody can, nobody can skip it saying that, you know, I'm the president, I am this, I am that, so I won't get COVID. Everybody who has exposure and frailties has got COVID. So many of us have died. So I feel that the ask is huge, but, you know, it's a transition, just like there was a transition from uh, a medieval world to a modern industrial world. Well, that, that phase is now got to move to something else because that phase is destroying the planet. So it's really a, a, a global venture which has to be done locally. That's a beautiful way to express it. And Thank you, Sheila. I've really enjoyed our little conversation across worlds here. And uh, thank you. Thank you.